to help myself just gauge what your background is, um, but just by show of hands, how many people in the audience already have a paper on the archive or a paper that's imminently coming on the archive on jet substructure? Okay, good. Um, how many of you have thought maybe um, that you want to leave the you know, pleasant world of leptons and missing <laughs> energy and, and dive into uh, the structure of jets and think that maybe there, there's a future in jets? <laughs> okay. And how many of you have never heard about jet substructure at all, uh, kind of skeptical and saying, what is all this jet stuff? That should be the rest of you. Okay. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, so, so what I'm going to do in these lectures is I'm going to go, in some sense, in the backwards order of the way that the field of jet substructure evolved. And uh, I'm going to first give you an overview and just kind of rah, rah, this is why we're excited about jet substructure. And then I'm going to kind of go from stuff that came out very recently um, so that we're all on the same page in terms of levels of ignorance. Um, that uh, th this is stuff that kind of only recently the jet substructure community has started to think about, which is really getting an analytic understanding of how one distinguishes quark jets versus gluon jets. Uh, there have been many kind of Monte Carlo studies, but here I can actually show you a calculation at leading order that tells you why it's so hard in some sense to tell the difference between quarks and gluons. Um, and that will be basically the substance of this first lecture. And then next time, I'm going to tell you about more of the things that kind of started off the whole jet substructure field, uh, ideas of boosted objects and ideas of, uh, of jet grooming. So I'll come to those later. But let me start just by giving you uh, an overview uh, about why, you know, I myself, why am I so excited about, about jet physics? Um, What's really remarkable is that we've had a renaissance in jet physics. You know, I could have been giving lectures on this, I guess, uh, since uh, the 1970s. Uh, that is, uh, okay, I wasn't born in the 1970s, but uh, the idea of jets and the idea that jets are collimated sprays of particles coming from the fragmentation of quarks and gluons, already that was known in the 70s, and the first jet algorithm, the method to identify jets was the Sturman-Weinberg algorithm, and that came out in the 70s. And once you had that notion of what a jet was, in terms of what its definition was, you could go to town and, and ask some of these questions that I'm going to address in these lectures. Uh, but it really wasn't until recently that we had a handle on jets. And for me, the watershed moment uh, was 2008, uh, with the development by uh, Kachiari, Salam, and Soyez of the anti-KT jet algorithm, which is quite recent. And I was a, a, a postdoc at Berkeley at the time, and when this paper came out, this is just a way of defining jets, this kind of opened my mind to the flexibility that we have. Uh, this is a way, an opening into Fortress QCD, uh, that we, uh, as theorists, as experimentalists, have a way of deciding how we want to measure jets. And anti-KT was a particular decision for how to measure jets that made a number of things very clear. Um, and in fact, first, for the first time in jet history, you had an algorithm that both experimentalists and theorists could agree on. And now, since 2008, a jet at the LHC is an anti-KT jet. Um, and since that time, for the past five years, it's been a really amazing time for me personally uh, to learn about the structure of QCD, to see how it's relevant for physics beyond the standard model, to learn about experimental realities. And what's been exciting also is to see a convergence of three different communities that, I mean, had talked in the past, but really had a, a, a focus point with jet substructure. So it's, it's uh, fashionable these days to draw uh, Venn diagrams. So at least if you're part of the snow mass process. So uh, <laughs> the, the three communities that have kind of come together around uh, the idea of jet substructure Um, at one side, you have the experimental community. And what has happened with the, uh, with the LHC is that there's, well, so let me just say, the jet substructure couldn't have been possible without developments in these three communities. And in particular, for the experimental community, the thing that happened is that you had a, an experiment, the LHC, and detectors, ATLAS and CMS, that had such a high level of granularity that you could start asking questions about the substructure of jets. Now, previously at the Tevatron, a jet was kind of a blah in the calorimeter, but now you have, uh, with the LHC, roughly speaking, five times better segmentation at a level where you could actually see the individual hadrons in a jet and start asking questions about those individual hadrons. And that's led to increased sophistication for studies of jets. And so now, as a theorist, you can start asking questions that at the Tevatron didn't seem that reasonable. Um, the other community that's come to the table has been the QCD theory community. 
and a number of developments over the past five to ten years that have enabled jet substructure studies. Uh, you probably have heard from Michelangelo Mangano last week about automated tools that allow you to do leading order jet cross-section calculations, even automated next to leading order cross-section calculations, all being folded into sophisticated Monte Carlo tools that allow detailed comparisons between theory and experiment. Uh, things like matrix element parton shower matching have really given us an unprecedented degree of accuracy for background measurements. Um, also, there's new approaches to things called uh, factorization, resummation, which I'm not going to talk about, that have enabled more precise calculations. And even some uh, ventures into understanding non-perturbative effects, which are relevant for jet substructure. And then finally, the community that I, I guess, started off in originally was the, was the beyond the standard model theory community. Um, and it was the realization that at a high energy collider like the LHC, where the center of mass energy is much larger uh, than the scales of, let's say, the top quark mass, the WZ uh, mass, or the Higgs boson mass, that you're really in a new regime where Lorentz boost mattered. This kind of came out of the BSM theory community, trying to figure out how to dig out signals, let's say, for you know, heavy resonances in Randall Sunder models that decayed to TT bar. You needed some kind of new techniques. Um, a number of novel jet observables that, you know, if you were just doing ordinary QCD, you would have never thought to do, but in the context of a beyond the standard model search became crucial. Uh, that's what the BSM theory community brought to the table. And we all meet at the center. Uh, you know, over the past five years, there's been a series of workshops called the Boost Workshops. There's one in Arizona uh, this August. And all of us in these communities are trying to push the boundaries of what we understand about jets, about jet substructure, to try to increase the range of things that fall under three categories. So experimentally, if you want to understand jets, you want to have things that are actually measurable. Um, if you're coming from the QCD theory community, you want to have things that you can actually calculate, so things that are calculable. And it doesn't matter if you can measure it if, and you can calculate it if it's not useful for something. And so the BSM community usually thinks about things that are practical. Um, and these lectures are, in some sense, three examples of things that are at this intersection where the various communities are trying to, uh, to make progress. Um, so the three examples of jet substructure in action, again, I'm to say it again, today we'll do quarks versus gluons, the very simplest thing you might try to do with jets, and then go into these more well, the more advanced topics, if you'd like, of, of boosted objects and jet grooming, where there's less analytic understanding, but I can still give you a qualitative picture. Um, so I've given uh, uh, handwritten copies of my notes, which you're well, welcome to annotate, rip up, whatever you want. Um, uh, one thing I note in the notes is just a general apology, that the stuff in my notes is a little bit biased towards my own work, but I'll try to keep everything pedagogical and won't really give citations. Um, despite the fact that in my own mind, uh, the anti-KT jet algorithm really was the thing that started the new way of thinking about jets. I'm actually not going to talk that much about jet algorithms. Um, I could devote a whole lecture to that. But let me say that for the purposes of this, to these two lectures, if you want to think about what a jet is, all a jet is is a collimated spray of hadrons. We don't really care where those hadrons come from. It could come from a quark or a gluon, could come from a boosted object. A collimated spray of hadrons. And we have to define where the jet exists within some radius r. And essentially, the breakthrough of anti-KT was to make this statement precise in one specific case where everyone could agree, yeah, that's a reasonable spray of hadrons contained within a radius r. Now, by writing this statement here, I've uh, swept a huge amount of physics under the rug. And so let me just mention the physics that I've swept under the rug and then uh, just as an apology and then move on. The first thing is you say, okay, a jet is a collimated spray of hadrons. So let's say I started off with a quark. As I'll explain more in a moment, quarks will fragment into hadrons. So the quark produced at short distances will become bound states of QCD at long distances. So we'll have, you know, a number of pi naughts, pi minuses, kaons, rho mesons, maybe a proton or two. Uh, and these particles that we're going to call as being within the jet are ones that are within some radius r. And there's also some ambiguities, you know, where do you choose that jet radius to be? Let's choose the jet, jet region such that the stuff within uh, the jet is such that the momentum contained in that jet is aligned along the center of that jet. Um, and immediately drawing this picture, you see, well, there's something ambiguous or strange here. 
Um, you know, I'm going to say that it's the spray of hadrons that I want to keep within a radius R. And the spray of hadrons that I keep within a radius R, that's going to be a color singlet state. Yet the thing that we're supposedly initiating that jet is uh, a color triplet in the case of a quark. And so you have a mismatch between color. The thing you measure at long distances is color singlet. Ultimately, the thing you care about, uh, and we'll talk about quark-luon discrimination, the thing you care about is a, has color charge. And so there's clearly a mismatch here. There's clearly an ambiguity. And this ambiguity is fundamental, and you just have to deal with it. Um, and for these purposes of this lecture, we'll just say, OK, there is an ambiguity, but uh, we're going to hope that the, uh, the error that I'm going to make by neglecting the difference between color uh, singlet things that I measure and colored objects that I'm trying to get access to, we're going to assume that those corrections scale like lambda QCD over the energy of the jet that I'm studying. This is not always the case, but I'm going to only give examples where this is the case. So roughly speaking, you can think of this spray of hadrons as being roughly correlated with the underlying partons that are initiating that spray. So another thing that's being swept under the rug when I talk about a jet is a collimated spray of hadrons, is I'm uh, neglecting the fact that, well, if I have a radius r, so I have some region, so if I'm drawing a picture of uh, uh, in the rapidity, oh, sorry, in the azimuth uh, uh, pseudo-rapidity plane, and I say, OK, I have my radius r in my event, and all the particles containing this radius r, these are in the jet, and everything else is outside of the jet. Well, what happens if, for example, I have two sprays of particles? One spray of particle over here and one nearby that also wants to have its radius. Uh-oh, there's overlap region. And indeed, that's an ambiguity, that's a frustration, that's an annoyance that we're going to ignore. Basically, in this talk or these lectures, we're only going to be studying one jet at a time. In some sense, the magic of the anti-KT algorithm was to resolve uh, this overlap ambiguity. Um, but then once you have that overlap ambiguity resolved and you have some well-defined procedure uh, for, for dealing with it, you can, to a reasonable approximation, just say, okay, a jet is this collimated spray of hadrons, it contains an irradius R, now I can study the inside of that jet and study jet substructure. So questions before I move on. This is the kind of the, the, the framework that I'm going to be in, uh, and uh, well, well, we'll see more as we, as we process. OK, so the first example that I want to do is I want to do the case of how do I tell the difference between a collimated spray of hadrons coming from a quark uh, versus the collimated spray of hadrons coming from a gluon. So let's just write out all the quarks. And let's, okay, I'll just write the one gluon, even though there's eight of them. Um, and we want to find some discriminant variable, some way of telling the difference between a quark and a gluon. So from the definition I gave up there about a jet, a jet looks like a jet looks like a jet. That is, it's just some collimated spray. Uh, but we'd like to know, to what extent can we tell whether the collimated spray is being initiated by one of these short distance objects? or comes from some other place, or is, you know, pilot background, whatnot. So some of these objects we know how to discriminate. So for example, if I have a top quark, and I make a top quark at short distances, a top quark at short distances doesn't at all look like a jet. A top decays to a bottom and a W, the W could decay to two jets. So if I want to tell what a top quark is, well, I'm, I'm in good shape. A top quark doesn't look at all like the things that I'm going to be studying, so we'll do more of this in the second lecture, but roughly speaking, a top quark ends up giving you three jets in the final state. Uh, so this is a beast that can be identified. Similarly, um, uh, charm and bottom, these are objects that can be identified from the fact that they create uh, D mesons or B mesons in the final state and the decays of the D and the B mesons can be used to help you tag that the thing that you made at short distances was a charm or a bottom. Uh, up, down, uh, and strange, these light quarks, it's an interesting thought to think whether they could be distinguished from each other, but from the point of view of this lecture where we're only going to be talking about uh, uh, essentially the, the QCD part of jets, we're not going to be talking about the charges of jets, these things are all indistinguishable. Uh, I don't know how to tell the difference between a three versus a three bar, and unless I use some kind of jet charge information, 
I don't really know how to tell the difference between a charge two-thirds object versus a charge one-third object. So these things, for the purposes of this lecture, are indistinguishable. But somehow, intuitively, it feels like these objects, which are color triplets, versus this object, which is a color octet, that there should be some way of telling the difference between these objects versus these objects. I should be able to say, at least on a statistical basis, if I make a short distance quark or gluon with some energy and I look at the pattern of radiation coming from that spray of hadrons, that pattern of radiation should somehow be different depending on the underlying color charge. And the goal of this lecture is to indeed build up an observable that can tell you the difference between the color charge. As I'll explain, um, the, uh, the difference that you'd have for a quark, the uh, relevant Casimir or CF, which is four thirds in the case of uh, SU3 color. In the case of a gluon, uh, we have CA, uh, which is three. And what I'm gonna show you is that on very general grounds uh, uh, from first principles, you can say, okay, what's the best you could imagine <laughs> with, with little effort, what's the best that you can imagine uh, uh, distinguishing quarks or gluons using kind of the leading order structure. And what I'm gonna sh show you um, in the punchline of the next hour, I guess, is that kind of just from the structure of QCD, you can ask, if I wanna have an efficiency X for quarks, that is, I wanna develop some kind of procedure that will keep quarks with a certain efficiency. Let's say X is 50%. 50% of the time I want to correctly identify a jet as having been initiated by a quark. The mistag rate for gluons uh, is X to the CA over CF, uh, which is uh, uh, nine quarters. And the color structure of quarks versus gluons, we're gonna be able to develop observables that are able to do this distinguishing such that if I keep, let's say, 50% of the quarks, you know, nine quarters is roughly speaking, uh, you know, two, so I'm able to keep something like, uh, like I, I'm forced to keep 20% of the gluons. And if I wanna do better than this separation between quarks or gluons, I'm gonna have to use more information or be more clever. Um, and we're gonna see this explicit example of, uh, of being able to do this separation. Okay, so in order to get to this punchline, let's talk a little bit more about, uh, about why jets form. Um, why do we expect jets to occur in the first place? Why should the long distance manifestation of a quark or a gluon, why should its long distance manifestation uh, be in the form of a jet? So the, the, the leading way of understanding why jets form at all is that jets arise because of soft collinear singularities of QCD. So in fact, there's gonna be three different steps, but here's step one that will tell us why jets what will happen. So let's say I have some amplitude for some QCD process. So I have some stuff coming in, and let's say I make a quark and some other stuff that I care about, perhaps. And then I wanna know, okay, if I add additional radiation to this event, where is that additional radiation likely to end up? Um, so I have a quark, I can have a gluon split off that quark, and I wanna know, in terms of the amplitude squared of this process, where is this gluon likely to appear? Where this gluon is likely to appear is where that quark is on shell. So this thing is singular, that is I'm gonna get the dominant emission if this guy can be on shell. So when can this be on shell? If I have part momenta P1 and P2, and the sum P is equal to P1 plus P2. I'm gonna have a singularity when P squared is equal to zero. And how can I get P squared equal to zero? What is a way to keep this guy on shell? And there's two different ways. One is the collinear way. Uh, the collinear way is uh, for the P1 momentum to be parallel to the P2 momentum. Uh, this is the collinear limit, and I'll show a little more explicitly why this is, why this is singular. And this uh, is the propensity for jets to form. When I have additional radiation in an event, if I look at uh, uh, you know, where an extra gluon would be, it's gonna tend to want to be collimated with, that is collinear with, one of the additional uh, uh, existing partons in the event. So that's the propensity for jets to form. Another way to put this uh, object on shell is if the uh, magnitude of this gluon 
uh, if this magnitude is small, so this is the soft limit, that is there's a singularity when this uh, gluon goes soft, um, so there's a propensity for gluons to be soft, but softness doesn't tell you uh, that jets will form. It's not telling things that things are collimated. And so while collinear singularities give me jets, soft singularities just give me annoyance. That is, you have a singular structure coming in QCD, which just throws radiation soft with respect to the existing guys, which means it's not necessarily going to be within some uh, radius of the initial partons that I'm looking for. And in some sense, a lot of the annoyance and, and uh, uh, complications of jets are coming from precisely uh, this, this soft annoyance. So collinear physics, that's what tells me that jets form. Soft physics is telling me why jets are hard to study. Okay, so that's one ingredient that I need in order to get, uh, to get jets. Another ingredient that I need to have to get jets, though, is I need to make sure uh, that at high enough energies, I need to have a theory that's reasonably weakly coupled. I need alpha s to be smallish. So in the standard model, you know, alpha s at the z pole is around 0.12. And why does this matter? Well, let's say I really say, okay, the only emissions I'm going to have are the ones that are the singular emissions. Um, but if I have a zillion of singular emissions, you know, zillions of collinear emissions, zillions of soft emissions, then if I have some quark going along and, you know, I just have alpha s that's huge, not perturbative, I just generate tons and tons of gluonic radiation. Um, and, you know, especially the soft radiation is not collimated with the original direction and all I get is some spherical ball of radiation. So it's necessary that the number of emissions that I have, which is governed by uh, the, the strength of the strong coupling constant, isn't so, so big, such that when I have a, a quark uh, going around, uh, the emissions that I'm going to get are going to be just a few emissions, you know, some of which are soft and going off at wide angle, those are the annoying ones, and some that are collinear, but I have enough of the collinear relative to the soft that I still get the formation of jets. And then the final ingredient that I need uh, in order to have uh, jets form is I better be able to say that the energy flow of partons So, so, um, uh, well, good. So I, I have a specific example in mind. If I want to have a coupling that's strong at all scales. So if it's, if it's strong at some scales, like in QCD, it's strong, you know, near lambda QCD, but you go to sufficiently high energies and you're asymptotically free, there is a regime where jets form. If I want to have a theory for which I have no regime where jets are forming, that means I need to have a strongly coupled, but then also a conformal theory. And in there, you don't expect jets to form. You expect just, there's, there's no scales left in the problem, um, uh, if, as long as it's strongly coupled. So there is some debate about exactly whether or not, uh, you know, th these collinear singularities can be strong enough such that despite the fact that you have the spherical blob of radiation coming from the soft, which is not correlated, whether the collinears are still strong enough such that you could get some kind of collimation. Um, but my understanding is that if alpha s were sufficiently big that this does not dominate and you end up getting uh, spherical distributions. So, so the last thing we need is that the energy flow of partons that I have uh, has to correspond to the energy flow of, of hadrons. So I can build up, you know, I have my, my quark coming along, it's radiating off, uh, uh, gluons, uh, and, you know, let's look at just the guys that are collinear. And I want to say, hey, these guys are really going to turn into a jet. That is, this, the gluons that are uh, collimated along with my quark, that these are going to go into the creation of energy flow in the infrared that actually is still going in that direction. So I want to say that the gluons that I have will end up in my jet cone. But that requires uh, that when the magic of hadronization happens, which somehow turns these colored objects into color singlets, that when that magic of hadronization happens, the, there's a, a rough correspondence to how this energy flow here is mirrored in the energy flow of hadrons here. 
And you could imagine uh, scenarios where this wouldn't necessarily happen. Um, you can imagine scenarios where you know, all this uh, gluonic radiation just goes into creating some very highly excited uh, uh, meson state. So you, know, you can imagine you have, uh, let's say, a quark uh, and an antiquark. And you know, each one is being produced at high energies. There's going apart. They have all this gluonic radiation, which means that you know, the, if you want to think about a color flux tube, you have some very kinked uh, you know, color flux tube of all sorts of energy stored in, 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 in this guy. And really what you're making when you have all these uh, soft collinear radiation is just making some highly excited meson state. But what happens in QCD is that you just don't arbitrarily store energy in terms of gluonic radiation. Uh, at long distances, energy stored in gluonic radiation wants to convert itself. Uh, you can lower the energy configuration by severing flux tubes by popping out uh, quark antiquarks uh, out of the vacuum, such that flux tubes can end on the quarks and antiquarks. And essentially, the highly excited state that you have splits apart. You can split the, the, the color flux tube, and then the, uh, the radiation can you know, persist on its merry way. And so because um, we're in a situation where, uh, for example, up quarks, down quarks are light compared to lambda QCD. It's energetically favorable to pop Q, uh, QQ bars uh, out of the vacuum as opposed to storing a bunch of energy in gluonic radiation. And because of that, when I make high energy quarks and gluons, uh, the long distance manifestation is just, uh, roughly speaking, flowing in the same direction as the short distance quarks or gluons. And because of this fact, um, if we want to understand how to do something like quark-gluon separation, in principle, you'd be very worried that the magic of hadronization would change what the long distance properties of the jet were compared to what you might calculate at short distances. But because of this fact that color uh, flux tubes can break, uh, the energy flow that you see at short distances is well matched by the energy flow that you see at long distances with corrections that uh, one expects will fall off as uh, lambda QCD over the energy of the jet that you're studying. So where we are right now is we say, OK, we think that jets will form. We think that we can study jets just by studying the amplitudes of short distance partons. And moreover, that the dominant behavior is uh, given by soft collinear singularities. And so we should be, use that, be able to use that information to figure out how to now separate quarks versus gluons. So questions, I'm going to spend a little bit of time erasing the board, but questions while I'm... OK, so let's make what I just said a little bit more precise. And so here is a key exercise for you, which if you haven't done it, uh, I encourage you to, to look into it. Um, is to show uh, in the soft collinear limit, soft and collinear limit, that the following is true about QCD amplitudes just at tree level. So if I take a uh, n plus 1 body phase space, and I sum over all polarizations of an amplitude that has uh, n plus 1 particles, but one of those particles is soft or collinear to another one. So I have a quark here, and I have a gluon oops, that's <laughs> soft or collinear to that quark. Then it's to show that in this limit, it's a good approximation to say that this full n plus 1 body phase space, so n plus 1, we have the one particle I'm identified plus, uh, or sorry, one particle that's emitted, and this is an n-jet cross-section, that this corresponds to, to a good approximation, that I sum over polarizations in the n-body process, where I still have this quark, so this quark here is the same as this one here, with the additional particles, this amplitude squared 
times the following structure. So, you know, ultimately I care where all the n plus one particles go. So here is, this tells me where all these n particles go and I need to now specify the space face for this uh, additional emitted gluon. That this is well approximated by the following. That the two relevant phase space variables are z and theta, which I'll describe in a moment. And then the probability to have uh, a gluon split off this quark has the following form in the soft and collinear limits. So you might have seen something uh, more complicated from, uh, from uh, Michelangelo in, in his talks, but this is just the soft and collinear structure. Uh, where CF is relevant for quarks, and, uh, and you would replace this uh, for gluons with CA. And so let's now look a little bit more about what this, what this formula says. So what we have is we have two phase space variables that are telling me where this gluon that's emitted can go. One is the energy fraction, Z, uh, which is the energy of the gluon that's emitted relative to the energy of the jet that was initiated. So I start off with this quark and emits off a gluon. And the probability of where that gluon will go is controlled by the energy fraction. And indeed, it's singular. It wants to be soft. The one over z structure is telling you that you want to have soft emission of that gluon. The splitting angle, which is uh, the angle between the, uh, the quark and the gluon, the splitting angle uh, also has a singularity. Uh, that is, the angle wants to, be, uh, wants to be small, these things want to be aligned with each other. And what you can do if you go through carefully and study the phase space, you can study that this, the form that you get in the soft end collinear limit just has this one over z behavior and this one over theta behavior with higher order terms that show up only when you go uh, uh, away from the soft end collinear region. Uh, so here, CF in an SUN theory is uh, n squared minus one over two n, which turns into four thirds in SU3. And CA is uh, just n, which obviously goes to, goes to three. Now, if you wanna be more sophisticated, you can go to just the soft limit of QCD, and there's a thing called antenna functions that tells you what the amplitude looks like in just the soft limit. Or if you're familiar with the just collinear limit, there's a thing called altarelli parisi splitting functions that tell you what the behavior is in just the collinear limit. But if you go to just the soft and the collinear limit, the structure looks remarkably simple. And there's a nice picture that you can draw to help you get a sense of what the phase space is for what these scoff collinear emissions could look like. So we have a structure that's uh, dz over z and a structure that's theta d theta over theta which means that if I think about where emissions can happen, these emissions happen uniformly, not in z or theta space, but uniformly in log space. So I have uniform emissions in the plane of uh, log uh, one over theta, log one over z. So in this extreme soft collinear limit, if I wanna think about where emissions could be, I'd say, okay, I roll the dice, I don't know where the gluon's going to be, but uh, it's gonna be at some value of z and theta. And if I write this as log one over theta and log one over z, the singularities happen when z goes to zero or theta goes to zero. So the singularities are going off the plane up in, and to the, uh, to the right. So when z goes to zero, this log uh, of one over z uh, gets uh, really, really big. So this thing is the uh, soft limit. So the soft limit is that way. Uh, the collinear limit is this way and the soft and collinear limit is, uh, is off uh, up and to the right. And this way of visualizing it makes it kind of intuitive where the singularity is. Uh, the singularity is coming from the fact that when written in these coordinates, log one over z and log one over theta, I can have emissions anywhere in the plane, but the plane extends all the way off to infinity. So if I have a reasonably hard emission at reasonably large angles, that would correspond to saying I emit uh, a gluon here in phase space. 
If I had something that was deep in the soft collinear limit, I would be way down here. Lambda QCD hadronization effects are way, way in the soft collinear limit. If I'm at high energies, lambda QCD is small compared to my high energies, so if I want to probe hadronization effects, I go way out in this plane. And we'll use this, uh, this plane in a moment in order to understand uh, analytically how one can tell the difference between CF and CA. Okay. So let me give you now kind of a template for thinking about jet substructure observables in general. <laughs> um, just a general strategy, so this, is, this will have the general strategy, um, which uh, we're going to apply for the specific cases of quarks versus gluons. So the general strategy is first to figure out your goal. Um, you know, there's many different things that you could try to calculate uh, in QCD, many different things that you could try to measure in experiment, but you want to have a specific goal in mind. Obviously, in this case, we want to do quark versus gluon discrimination. But you're not going to make very much money if you just say, oh, here's an interesting observable, uh, go out and, and measure it, go out and calculate it, unless you have a specific uh, uh, goal in mind. And moreover, not only do you have to have a goal in mind, you have to have some kind of underlying physics that makes you think you can achieve your goal. Um, so in this case, from looking at the soft collinear limit, we see there is a difference between quarks versus gluons. At this level, we don't see a difference between quarks versus antiquarks. Both quarks versus antiquarks have the same value of CF. There's no handle to get in there. Whereas at least with quarks versus gluons, we have this CF versus CA. We have some handle that we can use to discriminate these phenomena. Now, okay, you have some underlying physics, but you can't just go out and measure anything and hope that it, it's sensitive to that underlying physics. Uh, you need to have some kind of observable of varying degrees of, of cleverness in order that your observable is sensitive to this uh, CF versus CA. And I will give you an example of an observable that has this uh, feature. Um, there's many observables that one could use, but I'll do a specific example of energy correlation functions. Um, and then you need to use some kind of uh, analytic method, ideally, um, uh, or if, if worse comes to worse, you can run some kind of Monte Carlo simulation to try to uh, uh, estimate the discrimination power Um, because the best observable in the world, if you don't have some kind of uh, 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 validation that that observable actually probes the physics that you want, won't actually get taken up by experimentalists because ultimately what you want to do is have it applied to data. So in the case of, of uh, quark-gluon discrimination, we need to figure out how to use the CF versus CA to um, come up with an observable that probes that color factor. And so the intuitive picture is that um, if I look at CA, CA is a larger number, roughly a factor of two bigger than CF. And that means there's more propensity for a gluon to radiate soft and uh, collinear emissions than a quark to, to radiate those emissions. And so somehow, gluon jets should be fatter. Now, if you think about what it means for a jet to be fatter, that could mean any number of, of different things. So the first thing you might say is, I have a jet coming from a quark versus a jet coming from a gluon. And the quark, it's not going to radiate that much. And so in terms of the hadrons that I see in the final state, there's not going to be as many of them as compared to a gluon. A gluon will more copiously radiate, and so I should see more hadrons in the final state. Um, and indeed, if you do a Monte Carlo simulation and just say the multiplicity of hadrons within a jet, multiplicity of hadrons does a very good job of telling between quarks and gluons. 
And you say, you know, Coray, we should just go and calculate in perturbative QCD the multiplicity of hadrons. Um, and you'll fall on your face because the multiplicity of hadrons is governed by the complicated dynamics underlying hadronization. Um, and so no matter how good a discriminant you get from uh, just counting the number of particles in a jet, indeed that is a good discriminant for quarks versus gluons, but you don't have an analytic handle, you don't have a, an estimate for how well it would perform, um, and you're forced to rely on uh, you know, just purely uh, experimental techniques of isolating a good sample of quark jets, isolating a good sample of gluon jets, trying to measure their multiplicity distributions and go from there. So, we want to somehow find a way of measuring the fatness of a jet, its propensity to radiate uh, radiation, uh, in a way that is, probes just the short distance quarks and gluons, that I don't need to know anything about how the hadronization forms, and therefore I need to study something that depends dominantly on energy flow. Now, what would this look like if we succeeded? So, if we, we're actually able to achieve this goal, what would we have? We'd have some observable, uh, let's call it E for uh, the observable. Uh, this observable, when measured on a sample of quark jets, would show them to be skinnier for quark jets versus for gluon jets, they should somehow be fatter. And then if you want to discriminate between quarks versus gluons, you would say, okay, let me draw a line and say, well, if it's to that side of the line, it's skinnier, therefore it's more likely to be quark-like, and if it's on this side of the line, it's fatter, and therefore it's more likely to be gluon-like. Now, clearly, the way I've drawn this, which is not that un unrealistic, the way I've drawn this makes it clear that, you know, when you select quark jets, there's just no way of, uh, of isolating all of the, uh, of, of the gluon jets away. And so what you end up having is you end up having a compromise between the efficiency for seeing a quark, so zero to 100% efficiency, versus uh, the gluon uh, mistag between zero and 100%. And so if I make a cut that's too loose, I can keep all my quarks, but I also keep the gluons and I've done no discrimination. So one and one, if I don't do anything, then I haven't told the difference between quarks and gluons. Whereas if I have something that actually does separate quarks versus gluons, then at some quark efficiency, I can get a high quark efficiency for relatively low gluon mistag. So I have some curve like this. And the degree to which I can, so this way is better. The degree to which I can have high quark efficiency but low gluon mistag is the degree to which I could separate uh, quark jets versus, versus gluon jets. And so we need to come up with some observable that satisfies this property that actually does this discrimination. By the way, why do I care? I know, why do I care about telling the difference between quark jets versus gluon jets? This is the, the, the point, someone, someone at breakfast says that there should be a point, you know, midway through the talk where you pause, everyone breathes, relax, I tell a joke. Unfortunately, I don't have any good jokes. So someone says, hey, I, wanted to, I, I have this awesome module. I can tell the difference between quark jets versus gluon jets. Okay. Right, so, so uh, uh, jets that come from, notice that when I drew radiation, I was only drawing gluons radiating off. You can actually show that gluon splitting to QQ bar that splitting has no singularities, or sorry, no, sorry. <laughs> that, that's, that does not have soft and collinear singularities. And so when radiation comes off from random parts of the event, it's dominantly going to be gluon jets. And so if I can reject gluon jets, then I'm rejecting dominantly ISR uh, type structure. Um, similarly, QCD backgrounds to multi-jet final states, tons of gluons all over the place, whereas new physics uh, tends to give me more quarks. So if I can isolate quarks, then I uh, often can emphasize new physics over, uh, over standard model backgrounds. Um, well, if you're an experimentalist uh, and you're thinking about quarks versus gluon discrimination, you're also worried because the fact that quarks and gluons have different structure 
Um, for example, I just mentioned they have different multiplicity of hadrons, they'll have different levels of fatness, means that you'd love to be able to calibrate independently quark jets versus gluon jets, apply different jet energy correction factors for both, and if you can tell the difference between the two, that would help you uh, in, in, uh, in calibration. So it's not a small thing, and when I drew this Venn diagram of you know, people who care about things, you know, BSM, we want to see new physics, uh, QCD people want to test things like color structures of jets, uh, experimentalists want to be able to do better jet calibration, so you know, all these communities would love to have better ways of separating quarks versus gluons. And we're going to now see the challenge uh, to getting uh, good quark-gluon discrimination. Questions before I uh, erase more board? Okay, so I'm just going to hand you an observable that happens to do, have a chance of doing quark-gluon discrimination. And these are these energy, energy correlation functions. I could have chosen any other example, uh, but, but this, to my knowledge, was the first observable uh, for which actually an analytic calculation of the quark-gluon discrimination was done. And uh, surprisingly, it wasn't until 2013 that, you know, so someone said, here is the discrimination power that you can get from quarks versus gluons in this uh, soft collinear limit approximation. Okay, so here is the observable, and uh, just for simplicity of notation, normally in hadron colliders we talk about the PT of, uh, of an object, the transverse momentum with respect to the beam line, and to avoid having writing Ts, I'll just write energy. Uh, and normally we talk about uh, the uh, distance in the rapidity azimuth plane between two particles, uh, but just to save myself uh, some headaches since I'm going to energies, might as well just talk about angles. And energies and angles are the things that appear in, uh, in the soft collinear limit, so this is in some sense the more natural variables to use, but in your mind you can just fl flop these things for those if you if you'd prefer. So here is an observable that, well, I don't know if, it, um, if you could tell, uh, when I write it down, but this is one that, uh, that has a chance of, of discriminating. So the notation for the observable is unfortunate. So <laughs> C sub 1 is because there's also 2, 3, 4, 5, which you know, we'll see in lecture 2. And beta in parentheses is because we're going to use uh, an interesting f uh, freedom in order to test whether we might be able to improve quark-gluon discrimination. Um, and I'll often drop this, this beta you'll see in a moment. Okay, so what do I do? I take all particles that I have in my jet, and I take two different particles, and I multiply together the energy of one particle times the energy of the other particle times the angle between the two to the beta power. So I have a jet. Let's say I have two particles in my jet. Um, so if I just do the case of, of, uh, of two particles, so I have two particles with E1 and E2 with uh, angle theta 1, 2, and what this C1 uh, beta is, it starts off as just being, uh, so this is sum over all particles, sum over E1, E2, theta 1, 2 to the beta. And then this thing is dimensionful, but I want to be able to do quark-gluon discrimination at any uh, energy scale. So I want to divide out uh, by something to make it dimensionless, and let me just divide out by the sum over all the energies in the jet uh, squared. So in the cases of two particles, I would have E1 plus E2 squared. So I have now have a dimensionless measure of something. Now, looking at this, it's not obvious why this should have anything to do with quark-gluon discrimination. Um, and indeed, this is not the first thing that you would write down necessarily. Uh, the first place where this was written down in the literature was like Appendix I of some 150-page paper. And they said, oh, here's an interesting observable. Um, and you would say, well, why should this have anything to do with, with measuring the fatness of the jet? This doesn't look like a measure of fatness of the jet. And so we need to somehow see that this is indeed a measure of jet fatness. Oh, I just erased the thing I wanted to keep. Okay. So the name of the game is we're going to study everything in this very simple soft collinear uh, uh, limit. So in the soft collinear limit, we have uh, two things. So I'll redraw the picture that I 
that uh, I had before, where in the soft collinear limit, uh, the probability to have an emission at a given value of z and theta was this 2 alpha s over pi, cf for quarks, ca for gluons, uh, dz over z, uh, d theta over theta. And as I said before, this is uh, uniform emissions in the log z, uh, log 1 over theta plane. And what you can kind of think of is you can kind of think of a jet going along and just making emissions, and because the emissions are soft and collinear, uh, they don't modify the jet itself. So I have a jet going along, and it's maybe emitting soft, some collinear, some soft. Or if you went to Michelangelo Mangana's lecture, you'd know that actually the emissions have this nice pattern of being angular ordered. But that's, that angular ordering is not in this formula here. And so we have a number of emissions which can appear anywhere on this plane. So I have numbers of emissions, and each x here corresponds to an emission. And again, this direction is the soft and collinear regime, so emissions that are happening up in this corner, those are the ones that are well approximated by the approximation I'm making. And each one of these emissions corresponds to emitting a particle. That particle has some energy, and I can now just take all the various particles together, and I can uh, say, uh, well, uh, what are the products of their energies times their angle multiplied to some power? And the key simplification that we're going to make is we're going to make the uh, so-called strongly ordered Uh, approximation, that it, the observable, even though this observable was designed to measure all the particles in the, uh, in the jet and take all the pairwise combinations, the strongly ordered limit says, you know what, you know, most of the emissions are soft and collinear, most of these energies are small, the angles are small. Um, so the strongly ordered limit says, I only want to keep, or I only need to, uh, to focus on uh, the dominant emission. That is, the observable is not going to be set by the whole slew of all the various emissions. Only the leading emission is going to one that dominates. And then you could work harder to try to take into account subdominant emissions after that. And so looking in this plane, we now need to figure out, OK, which of these x's that I drew is the dominant emission? Um, and you would s say, well, isn't that one the dominant emission? Uh, because that's the one that's the least hard and the, the, <laughs> the least collinear. We have to be a little bit careful. We want to figure out for any individual observable, which is uh, the dominant emission. So let's go to this, uh, the, the strongly ordered limit. Uh, let's just look at uh, this case of two particles and ask, OK, what does that observable look like in the soft collinear limit? So if I just have one emission, um, and I drew it kind of funny, so let me redraw it again. So I have uh, E1 and E2, and this is my thing that's emitted. And I want soft emission, so E2 is much, much smaller than E1. Say the energy fraction, so remember this z was the energy fraction. The energy fraction is how much energy this guy is carrying relative to the whole jet. So this is E2 over E1 plus E2. But if I'm only considering the soft limit, well, I can drop this E2 because that's small compared to E1. Um, this whole thing is dimensionless. So in fact, C1 to the beta, or say C1 beta, is in this uh, uh, in this approximation where we say soft collinear and only focus on dominant emissions, we get a dimensionless thing, which is just z. That's coming from the, the E2 there. All the E1s cancel out in the numerator and the denominator, so we're just left with z times the angle theta between these two objects to the beta power. And so if I want to figure out what the dominant emissions are, I want to find out what emission gives me the largest value of z times theta to the beta. OK, so we're doing this on a log 1 over z, log 1 over theta plot. If I want to have constant values of this 1 over c, I just take logs of both sides of this equation. So I have log of 1 over c is log of 1 over z plus beta log 1 over theta. And so if you stare at this long enough, you realize, oh, emissions that uh, uh, or a line of constant emission in the log 1 over theta, log 1 over z plane, are just straight lines where the slope of that line depends on beta. So if I draw a line like, like this, so that's going to be the dominant emission that sets this value of the observable. So this is a line of constant uh, c. 
and the, the strongly ordered limit says one observable sets the value of the emissions and then all the rest I don't care about. If I were to have an emission, let's say right close to this line, that emission in principle would change the observable, but that happens one higher order uh, in the strongly ordered limit, so I'm not gonna account for it. If, however, I had it on the other side of the line, then it would change the observable, it would now be the dominant emission. And essentially what this strongly ordered limit says is take one emission, that's dominant, and then you say no other emissions uh, uh, anywhere else. And from this strongly ordered limit and this relatively simple form of the observable in this soft collinear limit, we are going to be able to figure out what the quark gluon discrimination is. Okay. So. S So maybe this is something that we should do uh, uh, this evening, uh, but it's a key exercise that uh, uh, is, is just a, 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 a test of probability, uh, which is the following. Uh, what is the probability uh, to get a value of C1 that's less than some value C1 max. So you will see in a moment why this is the right question to ask. And so this thing, sigma, it will depend on whether we're talking about a quark versus a gluon, but the sigma for a quark as a function of what the C1 max is. Um, with a little bit of thought and thinking about probability uh, and that picture over there, the probability to get a value of an observable less than the maximum value of the observable is going to be the following. So it's e to the minus two alpha s over pi cf. So this uh, two, s, two alpha s pi over cf, that's just the same thing in that emission probability, times the area under the c max curve So what is the intuition for this? I want, to have a, uh, I want to have a value for the observable less than some maximum value. So I set my maximum value, I draw my line, and I want to say the only emissions that I could possibly have are ones that are below that line. And you can convince yourself that it has this funny exponential form. So let's do as a, a series expansion in alpha s. So what is this thing as a series expansion in alpha s? So at alpha s at zero, this thing is just one. Um, if I just have a quark with no irradiation, well, then there's only one particle. My energy, energy correlation function, well, there's nothing to correlate, so it's just zero. So what is the probability to be less than some maximum value? Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, at this order in alpha s, I, I'm always less than that maximum value. The value of my observable is zero, and so that's where the one comes from in this expansion. Uh, at order alpha s, I have one emission, one emission of radiation, and that emission can't lie within that triangle. And so I'm not allowing things to be emitted uh, within that triangle. And then it's something maybe we can do this afternoon of probability to just say, okay, at high orders, you have a plus one half alpha s squared, the, that same area uh, squared and so on and so forth. And what this, uh, 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 what this value is, When you calculate that area, it's just calculating the, uh, the area of a triangle in the, in the log plane, what you find is you find that the, uh, for a quark, the probability to have, uh, uh, to, to give a, a value of your observable less than some maximum value is uh, e to the uh, minus, uh, sorry, is a factor of two missing? There's a factor of two that I don't know about in my notes. I think this is two alpha s pi cf over beta log squared of uh, r to the beta over c1 max. And then the same thing with gluons uh, with cf replaced by ca. Okay, so uh, I, I don't necessarily expect you to follow what I did here, but at this point you should say, oh, you've declared this is, you're victorious. Like what? 
<laughs> that's the final answer. Like, what do you mean that's the final answer? You haven't done anything. So what does this say? This says that I had this curve that I was drawing of my observable, in this case it's C1, and I had some distribution, uh, the uh, the normalized cross-section for that distribution, and I set some maximum value C1 max, and I wanted to know what was the probability to have uh, an emission, or to have a value of the observable less than that value of C1 max. Well, that's just the integral of that region, and that tells me how many quarks do I keep. So uh, sigma Q uh, of C1 max is just the quark efficiency. For a given cut C1 max, this is the chance that I'm keeping a quark. And then for the gluons, uh, the, uh, th this, this same object now for gluons is what my uh, rejection, or sorry, what my mistag is. So my gluon mistag uh, is just this shaded region here, that is with the probability of getting a value observable uh, less than that value. And what we see, is really interesting. The only difference between quarks versus gluons in terms of this, what's often called a cumulative distribution, is that whatever I want for gluons, for a given value of C1 max, I can obtain it from the value I got for quarks for a given value of C1 max just by multiplying by Ca over Cf. That is, if I want to keep 50% of the quarks, I want to draw my value of C1 max such that I keep 50% of the distribution, in this strongly ordered uh, soft collinear expansion, uh, the, uh, the number of gluons that I'm going to keep is however many quarks I kept to the C over CF power, uh, and C over, over CF is, as I said, nine quarters, and that tells you in this limit the best you can do for quark-gluon discrimination unless you add uh, some additional information. So that result is a little bit interesting. So let me just draw it. So this is the plot that we were hoping to get, uh, plot from zero to one of uh, quark efficiency versus gluon rejection, or gluon mistag. And the curve is for a given quark efficiency x, I always uh, get a gluon efficiency of x to the nine quarters, so it looks like this, such so that this at 0.5 corresponds to a gluon at 0.21. And what's particularly perplexing about this calculation is that I put in this ability to try to improve my discrimination power. I, I specifically uh, put in this beta to try to say, well, maybe if I probe a little bit more deeply about the angular structure, um, this guy tells me, you know, is the radiation that's emitted, is it radiated more at large angles versus small angles? In this plot, this corresponds to saying, do I want emissions that are more like this or this or, or this and defining my observable? And none of that mattered. <laughs> that at leading order in this limit, Quarks and gluons, the only amount that they want to be discriminated by is by their color factor. And therefore, you have to do two things if you want to do a better job. You have to come up with perhaps a new observable. Uh, but also, you have to do a calculation at some higher order of accuracy to figure out whether that observable has any chance of doing increased uh, quark-gluon discrimination. And this is somehow famous. I mean, people hadn't done this calculation uh, uh, previously, but people were always recognizing that these, all the various variables that people had proposed for quark-gluon discrimination kind of always give roughly the same results, and this kind of tells you why. In the, the, the limit that dominates uh, the, the formation of these quarks and gluon jets, in that limit, uh, things like extra angular information just don't help you. It's only the color factors that you can use. Okay, so let's interpret this result a little bit, uh, a little bit more. So, um, sorry, I realized my notes are correct, not that it matters. 
happens is done. Um, so, so the thing we actually calculated was these cumulative distributions that gave us the quark gluon discrimination. But let's actually look at um, what the, uh, the these actual distributions are. You know, I just sketched what these distributions were, but let's actually see what the distribution is for uh, for uh, this observable. So, if someone says uh, the uh, probability to get a certain value c less than a certain value, and you want to turn that into a cross section, if you just take the derivative of this guy with respect to that observable, uh, that will give you the actual cross section, or the normalized cross section, in this case for quarks. And what does this distribution look like? So it has a kind of fun form. So we take this exponential form, we take a derivative with respect to the C1, and what do we get? 2 alpha s over pi, Cf over beta, 1 over C1, log r the beta over C1, e to the minus alpha s over pi Cf over beta times log squared of r to the beta over C1. Okay, so let's see what this thing looks like. So the easiest thing we can do is we can just say, okay, we want to do a series expansion in alpha s, and the lowest order expansion in alpha s, we want to just keep the leading term in alpha s, and that's just this piece uh, right here. And we'll uh, deal with this extra exponential factor in a moment. So let's look at this guy. So what does this guy look like at lowest order in alpha s? Lowest order in alpha s, uh, well, uh, it behaves like 1 over c1 times a logarithmic factor. And so this thing just kind of blows up like this. For quarks, it blows up such that, uh, well, proportional to Cf. And for gluons, all I would do is switch Cf for Ca, and all that does is change the normalization of the distribution. So quarks and gluons look like that, which looks not at all <laughs> like the pictures that I was drawing here. Now, Looking at this, there's a number of confusions that you would have. So first of all, I said that this is a probability here, so when I take the derivative, I get a normalized cross-section. A normalized cross-section means that when I integrate over this whole thing, I should get one. Okay, well, looking at this thing, I have one distribution that's going singular, uh, and another one that's going singular, and their integrals are supposed to be the same, which seems impossible, except that, um, uh, the calculation I did here was uh, for real emission, I, where I really emitted a, a, a gluon, whereas I could also have virtual emission of a gluon, that is, uh, uh, virtual diagrams. And that, uh, if I, at lowest order in alpha s, when I have a virtual diagram, I don't actually have an observable that I would uh, uh, measure, the value of the observable would be, be um, zero. And so buried in here is a delta function. Uh, from uh, virtual diagrams, such that when I integrate over this whole distribution, I would actually actually get one. But somehow this behavior, the CF and CA behavior, the thing I would get at lowest order in alpha s, the thing that I would calculate if I just were doing a fixed order calculation, is not really capturing the dominant structure of the physics, um, and that we need to look in more about this exponential piece. So this exponential piece has a name. It's called a Sudikoff form factor. And what the Sudikoff form factor is doing is it's accounting for all orders in alpha s. Now, only in this uh, soft collinear limit, only in the strongly ordered limit, but it has contributions at all orders in alpha s. And the behavior of this observable, oh, sorry, the behavior of the Sudikoff factor dramatically modifies what you would get from a fixed order calculation. So if you did your next to leading order calculation for quark versus gluon discrimination, here's the distribution that you would get. If instead you do this strongly ordered calculation, you get something that has a qualitatively different structure. So, uh, so, 
so at large values of C1, uh, you match onto what you would get from the, the fixed order calculation. But then when C1 gets really, really, really big, that lar log in the exponent gets really, really, really big. And e to the minus a really big number uh, is very small. And so the distribution, far from going to the singular region, actually turns over. Um, and this thing is often called a Sudikov peak. For quarks, this CF is small, so you start off small and then you turn over this way. Uh, for gluons, you start off big, CA, but then that exponential factor, it has a larger CA in it, in it, and so it turns over more quickly. And what it really is, this quark versus gluon discrimination, is coming from the fact that the Sudikoff peak locations between quarks versus gluons are at different values. For small values of CF, it, you have to go longer before the Sudikoff turns you over. Uh, for large uh, values of CA, uh, you rise faster and then you, uh, you tank more quickly. And so this is the essential physics. of quark versus gluon separation. And that essential physics is uh, surprisingly, despite the fact that the whole distribution depends on this angular exponent beta, the actual separation between quarks and gluons, you can move them around as much as you want and, uh, and, and you can't do uh, uh, much better than the CF versus CF. Um, Now, if we wanted to be a little bit more careful, we could add higher order effects. The calculation that I showed in this lecture, which already was complicated enough, but is the leading piece, often called leading log, uh, and you could try to do a little bit more clever and go to next to leading log, essentially account for not just single emissions, but multiple emissions, accounting for subleading uh, uh, terms. So uh, here I could have, uh, multiple emissions, be more careful about uh, uh, going beyond uh, using soft and collinear. Uh, here, I was treating alpha s as if it were just a fixed number. We could try to see whether quark gluon discrimination improves by uh, having uh, alpha s running. Uh, you could try to incorporate uh, uh, interference effects. And, uh, if one goes through these various terms, one finds that there actually is some uh, benefit to using different observables versus other ones, but kind of the, the basic picture of that quark versus gluon discrimination is a tough game uh, that, that, uh, that persists. Okay, so uh, what I wanna do now, just I'm gonna summarize and then take some questions and then we can all go to, to lunch. So the reason why I wanted to show you this example is this, is this is an example that highlights the type of techniques that are used in jet substructure, where you have this flexibility uh, in determining what kind of observables you use in jets in order to accomplish different things, in this case, accomplishing quark versus gluon discrimination. And once you've identified what the underlying physics is, in this case, the color factors, uh, one can then go to town and try to use, in this case, analytic techniques um, and uh, in the next lecture, we'll use just heuristics to show why uh, 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 the observable that you've chosen does or does not uh, actually get you the separation uh, that you want. Uh, and what we're gonna do next time is deal with two types of generalizations. Um, here, the jets that we were looking at were fundamentally one prong like. You threw one hard quark or gluon, you look at the radiation pattern around that. Um, but the, in some sense, the, the breakthrough in jet substructure, and the reason why it's called jet substructure, is looking at multi prong observables. That instead of looking at a jet as being some spray of radiation that has one hard core and then a lot of soft radiation around it, um, there are certain cases, which we'll talk about, which come up when you're in uh, highly Lorentz boosted regimes, where you want observables that are not sensitive to just the radiation pattern around a central core, but are sensitive to the radiation pattern, let's say, around three cores, and I'll explain why this would be relevant for, for boosted tops. Um, so that's one generalization that we can talk about, and 
partly the reason why I didn't start with this is because I don't have nice analytic tools. I can't show you a calculation in QCD yet uh, that tells you about this, but I can give you some heuristics. And the next thing that I want to talk about uh, next time is jet contamination. Um, I started off this lecture saying what a jet was, uh, was hadrons within a radius r. And in a perfect world, the stuff that ends up in your radius r would come just from the thing you want to study. So in the case of, uh, of a quark, the stuff in your radius r would just be the gluonic radiation coming around that, that, uh, that, that quark. But in real life, there's plenty of other things that can come out of left field and enter into your jet. Um, you can have, as uh, was already mentioned, initial state radiation can come in. But the big, big, big thing that's going to happen at the LHC is that we're going to have a high pileup, or we already do have, a high pileup environment where if I just define a region of my detector and say, oh, that's a jet, well, that jet includes not just the collision you want to study, but many, many other collisions. And so this kind of strategy of coming up with observables or algorithms or techniques to dig out information about jets will be able to apply similar type of logic to, uh, to these two uh, cases next time. Um, so with that, let's spend maybe just five minutes uh, with, uh, with pressing questions that you have before uh, heading to lunch. Thanks.